Spicer here with the Beer Network. Thank you for being with us today. We're going to continue our conversation about conversion culture. You understand that that what has happened and what I think started probably is a very sincere um, approach to helping people meet Jesus has been contorted into this tool to become some measuring stick of how effective ministries are and, and, and how much momentum a church has. Uh, you know, I've heard people tell me even, well, you know, Ken, you can't manage what you don't measure. And so you should be counting, uh, you know, counting heads and counting salvations. And, you know, we did that for about six months. And what I realized is that either my ushers couldn't count or there was never as many people in church as I thought there were or thought there should be. And so it was a very depressing uh, thing. It's like, man, God would move, people would receive Christ and all this stuff. But but when the numbers weren't what I thought they were so that they would be allow me to, you know, brag about them or feel good about them, then I was just discouraged. It's just the wrong focus. So we stopped counting. And uh, I had somebody ask me uh, just just last year, hey, Ken, how many people do you have in, you know, on Easter? And I said, I have no idea because we don't count. Um, and then just the look on that person's face like I was some kind of a reprobate. But let me tell you something. God moved. You know, we, one year we had over 3,000 people in a football stadium, and we had far less than that last year, and it was a better service because we weren't trying to hit some measuring stick so we could run around and say, oh, we had this many people. Those things don't matter, you guys. They just don't matter. It's a wrong focus. It's a waste of energy, and not just the church in America, but America is suffering for this nonsense because now when we really need disciples who have been discipled over the last decades upon decades, we don't have them. We don't have those people. We have people that are just trying to be another celebrity. We got pastors running around taking pictures with people in their church on Sunday like there's some kind of little, you know, superstar. And, and instead of focusing people on the goodness of God, and I'm not trying to be a nitpicker here. I'm telling you, these things matter because it goes to the, to the heart of the problem that we have here, that it's all about driving numbers and showing this production and showing this productivity and showing our sincerity that we're going to lead these people to Jesus. Listen, we're going to close today. Well, let me, let me just go back one. Before we close, I want to go back to one thing where you might hear people say, well, you know, you need to confess Jesus before men. And so, you know, we're going to give you a chance to, to walk down here in front or raise your hand and, and remember what Jesus said. If you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my father. But if you deny me before men, I'll deny you. So put this stark fear on people that if you won't raise your hand or walk the aisle in a church, how on earth are you going to ever going to live it outside these buildings? And so we manipulate people into coming forward. Let's look at that verse. Where, where that idea comes from is in Matthew 10, 32 and 33. Jesus says, therefore, whoever confesses me before men, him I will confess before my father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I will deny him before my father in heaven. So let's just think about it logically for a moment. How do you get saved? You have to believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God. And uh, I think we've addressed that in the past, but I'd like to take a whole section or segment and talk about, you know, James chapter two, where he says, even the demons believe and blah, blah, blah. And we've heard that refute this idea of believing, but I'm telling you, I could take you to at least six or seven verses just in John chapter three, where Jesus says, if you believe you'll have everlasting life. And he says some variation of that statement all throughout John chapter 3, we have Paul the Apostle saying, you know, if you believe on the Lord Jesus, you and your house shall be saved. When he was asked, point blank, how do I get saved? So this notion that that James is saying that, that believing is not a big deal, you got to do something, that's not exactly what James is saying at all. And, uh, and he's actually complimenting the gospel. And I can prove that to you, and, and I know I have already probably, but I'll do it again in depth. But, but let's go back to my point here. How do you get saved? You have to believe in Jesus, okay? How do you go to hell? What does that look like? Well, you have to not believe in Jesus. So here it looks like if we confess Jesus, we're good. If we don't confess him and do something, some outward you know, work, let's say, then suddenly he's going he's gonna to reject us. So that means, let's just say, let's take that to the nth degree. That means you're going to go to hell. So is suddenly now the gospel based on your work and you've got to do something or he's going he's gonna, to you know, deny you before the Father? I don't think he's saying that. 
So what would the confession be? The confession would be, I believe in Jesus. But that doesn't mean you got to do that in front of a church. What if you just did it in front of the Holy Spirit? What if you just did it in your life after you believed? See, this is what Romans 10, 9, and 10 says. And people call this the Roman road. And Paul says it this way in verse 9, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Okay? To me, that, that verbiage seems to be backwards because I don't think you can confess until you believe. But Paul seems to anticipate that rebuttal. And then in the next, very next verse, in my opinion, he clarifies what he's trying to say here and what he is saying. In verse 10, it says, For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So once you believe, you're born again. And that confession is something that's automatic. If you're married, when you met your spouse, and as soon as you believed that that person was going to be your spouse someday, the confession was flying out of your mouth because you believed it. Even before it happened, you believed that that was going to happen. And you told everybody ad nauseum, you couldn't shut up about him or her. And so it's the same thing. You don't have to worry about the confession. It's coming if you believe. If you believe in your heart that Jesus is the Christ, I promise you that's going to come out of your mouth. And you don't even have to think about it. You're going to go down to the store and you're just going to tell somebody, you know what? Uh, I believe Jesus is my Savior. And you're just going to have a conversation. And it's not going to be some awkward thing about, hey, could I, could I talk to you about Jesus for a minute? I mean, how do you know you're saved? It's not just about saying a prayer. You know what's funny is they say it's not about saying a prayer all while gearing you up to say a prayer. And, and this is the thing that bugs me about the inconsistency of an altar call and the gospel. There's this confliction that happens because we're saying we want you to be saved, but instead of preaching the gospel to you, then we're preaching your works to you. And anybody, anybody, if they're in a situation like that, is going to feel a little bit convicted because they know that they're not perfect. And so the altar call has a tendency to prey on that idea that that person's good, they want to do the right thing, and now I'm going to capitalize on that feeling and that emotion by, by, by reeling them in here. And then I can brag about it. I can put it on a piece of paper. We can talk about how many people were saved when that person's probably been saved for decades. Do you know that if somebody's in a church in America today or in a, in, in, in a crusade environment, you realize that person's not in there going, wow, man, what is this? I never heard such a thing as this. No, they probably have been in church and out of church and in church and out of church. You know, who knows, for years, it's not like they're brand new. And so they're already, you know, understanding of the culture to some degree. And I can tell you that altar call can be a very manipulative thing in order to try to pump up numbers and get people to think that they got saved again or rededicated again when we proved, you know, a couple of weeks ago, I think it was when we were in Galatians with Paul, that he was calling the Galatians foolish and basically stupid for believing, you know, some works-based gospel after they were saved. But, you know, one thing we don't see Paul do in Galatia is to lead them in a sinner's prayer and get them rededicated, not even once. You know what he did do? He kept reminding them of who they are in Christ, and he kept reminding them of who God was and who Jesus was, and he was just hammering that drum continually through those verses and those chapters of Galatians. He never did say, well, now that we've got that cleared up, now come on over here, now say this prayer with me, and say it exactly like this, because you need to confess. No, nope. it's not like that. It doesn't work like that. That's not the truth. That's not the gospel. Amen. I, I, maybe you think I'm nitpicking, but I'm going to keep picking the nit because somebody needs to hear this message. We need to quit acting like this is church and this is what church ought to be. This is not what it should be. We should be preaching Jesus fast and furious and let people know how good he truly is. Okay. So now I'm going to leave you with this idea here. 
and we're going to go to Acts 8. Now, if you know the story, persecution had come to the church at Jerusalem. Uh, They were all disobedient, by the way, because in Acts 1, Jesus said, you're going to go to Judea and Samaria and to, you know, uh, uttermost parts of the world, and they never left. So here we are now some years later, Acts 8, persecution came. Philip, one of the seven waiters uh, from Acts 7, he goes down and preaches in Samaria. And verse number 4 of Acts 8 says this, Therefore those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ to them. And the multitudes with one accord heeded the things spoken by Philip, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits, crying with a loud voice, came out of many who were possessed and many who were paralyzed, and lame were healed. And there was great joy in that city. So they heeded the things spoken by Philip. And this is amazing because we don't see him do what you'd normally see in some kind of evangelistic setting. He doesn't do an altar call. He doesn't lead this big corporate prayer or anything like that. Listen to verse 12 now. But when they believed Philip, as he preached the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus, both men and women were baptized. So what's he preaching that they believed? The things concerning the kingdom of God and Jesus Christ. And everybody believed and everybody then got baptized because they believed. It's as simple as that. We don't see anywhere in the record, and I'm going to go through the book of Acts here uh, next week, and I'm going to walk through some of these scenarios and show you that you don't see this tactic in the first century church. You just don't. They're preaching Jesus, and people are responding. They're preaching Jesus, and people are saved. They're preaching Jesus, and people are healed. They're preaching Jesus, people are delivered. They're not trying to gin up this emotion. There's no fog machines, no fancy lights. There's no men uh, running around looking like women leading worship. It is simply just men and women of God preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Nobody's trying to dazzle anybody. Nobody's trying to be a superstar. Jesus is the superstar. And this is the problem with the American church. This is the problem. Look, I love the church. It's the American church I have a problem with because we've lost our way. We focused on the wrong things. People have built this idea up that it's their job to make sure people are saved. It's not. It's your job to preach the gospel. It is God's job to make sure they're saved. Let's get that straight. And if we could get that straight, then I'm telling you, we could have revival in the land. Because I don't know if you're paying attention or not, but politicians on both sides of the aisle have sold you out. And our only hope, hear me, our only hope is Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And as we believe in him and look for opportunities to share his truth, and as we speak truth to the lies of our culture and the lies in society and those Christians standing in pulpits that have no backbone to call out the lies and the inconsistencies in culture, and they will tell me I'm too political And they're being political by trying to shut me up, but yet they won't go so far as to call out the lies of the devil. It's an amazing time for me. It's hard to believe that we're here, but indeed we are. And friend, it's time that the church in America answer the bell and start preaching the gospel. We're not, God doesn't hate people, even those people that are hateful. But it doesn't mean we can't call out their lies and stand on truth and not compromise. Being friendly and being, you know, in love or lovely to people doesn't mean that we have to take their their egregious acts as truth or their lies as fact. These are the days. And what we do from here on out, if there is ever any history recorded from these days, which I kindly doubt it, it will, it will not look favorably on the church. We need to get focused on what's true and what's right. Amen. Well, listen, that's all of my time today. Thank you for joining me, and I'll see you right here next week on Revere Network.